My name is Cyrus Shoal, and I'll be talking today about uh, NDL, which is an R package for large-scale naive discriminative learning. Um, this is uh, work that I've been doing along with my group back in Tübingen, uh, Peter Millen, uh, Peter Hendricks, Michael Ramskar, and Harold Vine. So to start off, a big idea. Um, this is the one that attracted me to this interesting model. Uh, I did a lot of work with HAL and other types of models in the past, but this is a new one for me. And, and the idea that, that got me interested in this kind of model is that it's something that captures holistically the predictive nature of language use. And I'll try to convey what I mean by the predictive nature here. Um, when we're recognizing words in a stream of language and understanding what they mean, at some level, I think, it, it stems from uh, accurate predictions about what's coming up next in that stream. And I'll give you a little toy example. Um, you have a question, where did this guy go? You're looking for somebody. And then you see this wet scrap of paper. Now, why a wet scrap of paper? My children have this tendency to pour liquids on paper around the house. And that paper might contain a very important message. And when that happens and, and the ink gets uh, wet and, and starts dripping, you can't read it anymore. So let's just say that happened. And then you, all you get is this, very short message, and a lot of it got wet. What's the final word? If you feel like you know what the final word is, shout it out. Somebody, please. Fishing. Fishing, OK. Um, now, how did you predict that? What was going on? And do we have a model that can get at what led you to that strong gut feeling that it was fishing, right? Um, I'm not going to present any data on this kind of experiment, but I think this is the kind of model that could explain that. And there are other ones, too, that could also get at it, but um, this is one that really is, is aiming directly at this kind of thing. Now, it could have been another thing. It could have been uh, financial planning. Who thought financial planning? Anybody know, right? <laughs> now, why not financial planning? Because you don't usually see that in this kind of context. So context is really important, I think, and uh, predictability is important. So uh, we wanted to found this idea. I mean, Harold Byen and Michael Ramskar were really the instigators of this on information theory, Shannon's ideas, and also learning theory, which is this very, very long tradition of uh, psychological study of, of behavior um, and how creatures learn to do certain things in certain contexts. So how about the Rescorla Wagner model? I mean, when you get back to it, it's one, been one of the most successful uh, learning theories out there. Uh, the idea was, let's try to apply that to language and see what happens. Now, uh, many of you have already Heard of the Rescorla Wagner model, you know it very well. I'm going to give the 10 second nutshell, but it's really not giving it justice. So if you want, definitely look at it later. But basically, the idea that you have uh, an association, a weight, that uh, is based on the weight at the previous time step in time, plus some sort of delta. And that delta depends on certain things. What does the delta depend on? Well, in uh, this situation, you have some constant, constants where, in, since this is a language situation, and uh, it's not a rat in a cage. We're just going to say that these are constants, this alpha and beta. They just stay the same. So they really don't get involved too much. Lambda is a constant also. It's a maximum value. And then you have this uh, sum of the active weights. So basically, if something's very active, then it'll um, change the weight a lot if it's there. But if it's not there, so let's say you have a certain uh, stimulus or a cue and an outcome is not there, then you subtract it. So that's sort of the key of Rascola Wagner. If something's there, you add. If something's not there, you subtract. And that's how you train it. This is a very simple training algorithm, delta rule. So that works great if you have a small set of cues and maybe a couple of possible outcomes. What if you scale it to language? Does it still work? And that was the question that came to our minds. And so um, Danks came up with this idea back in 2003-2004 of estimating the equilibria of the Rascola Wagner systems. Um, now, what does that mean? It means that uh, as you learn the, um, the weights connecting each cue to each outcome, they're volatile. You know, first you see an, uh, something when, uh, when you expect to, and then you, it goes away, and then you have to reduce the weight, and it goes up again. So there's a lot of volatility as you learn these weights. But um, if you project into the asymptotic future, you might be able to find a steady state, an equilibrium state, and that will give you an idea of the final end stage of learning. So he gave this kind of mathematical notation. I won't go into that. Uh, but basically, matrix notation, you have this uh, matrix of cues, and then you have a matrix of weights that you give to the cues, and that helps you predict the outcomes. You do a little bit of uh, linear algebra, you create this thing called the pseudo-inverse of the Q, Q 
Q co-occurrence, how often Qs co-occur with other Qs. You multiply that by the uh, probability outcomes, and you can calculate the weights. So this is sort of a shortcut, like the end stage of learning. You get all your uh, events together, everything, every Q that's happened with every outcome, how often. You do some math on it, and you can get some weights out that will tell you um, what the end state of learning was. So it's a system of actually n simultaneous equations. And so we wrote an R package to help do that. To give you an idea of what this looks like, this is actually, it looks sort of complicated, but this is actually not complicated enough. Why? Because there's only 24 cues and 24 outcomes. And uh, you can see there's a lot of weights there. Each, each line is a weight. But imagine now we're talking about language. You'll see that we can get 800 uh, or even 10,000 cues. These are 10,000 features that we might have. And you might have uh, 100,000 words in your language, so 100,000 <coughs> outcomes. So this is, this is actually not complicated enough. But you get an idea of how much information could be in this set of weights uh, connecting cues to outcomes. So you can get a lot of metrics out of that kind of data. You can get, for example, the sum of the weights coming into one outcome. And that's actually the same as the delta V component in the Rosporla Wagner learning system. You also can look at the sort of uh, in degree for an outcome, like how many uh, non -negligible, negligible weights. A lot of weights are near zero, but there are some that are negative and positive. So how many of those? Um, are there. Compare different words based on that. You can look at number of competitors. If uh, something is active, you can also see how active all the other outcomes are with the same sets of cues. Some might be even more active, like if you have the cues for a word, another word might be more active than the word you were thinking you'd get. So you can see how, what kind of competition is going on. It's sort of interesting dynamism you can get out of this kind of system. Anyway, um, the R package is free. It works on all the major platforms. Uh, if you use R, this looks very familiar because our package is on the main archive system, the, so it's freely available and instantly downloadable. You just type that in with the NDL package and install it, and then you can uh, start. I mean, there's something that has to happen in between those two lines where you prepare your events. So I'll just show you a real quick um, info about what that is. You have to take your input, in this case language, although it doesn't have to be language. You can really train it on any type of cues and outcomes. But you set it to three kinds of data. You have the cues. In this case, we're using groups of three letters, and the number sign is the word separator. So those are three cues, actually, on the top left there. And you have one outcome, which is the word the. Now, you could say it's a word. We also call it a lexeme, because we're trying to get at more than just the words, but at maybe some more um, semantic, conceptual stuff here. But let's just say that's your outcome, and you saw that once. And then the next one in this little sentence, like this and like this, and this will give you some interesting training, you know? So like, uh, there's this uh, Q is in common with, with this one, but two different outcomes. So you can see there might be some Q outcome competition that begins right here. But this is tiny. We, we're we're going to do this on 9 billion words. And it scales up. Software does scale up to the billion word size. So if you want to do that, you keep on going through a whole corpus and do this. Now, what we like to do more often is something like this. And you'll notice the difference. What we're doing here is we have, on the first line, three outcomes, three things that occurred. The, Little, and Fox. And so those three outcomes are now being trained to have co-occurred with whatever that is, 9, 10, 20 cues. I can't count right now, but that, those, those are lots of cues. And what this does is it spreads things out. It gives you some uh, cue learning on the cues from the surrounding words. But let's say you're looking at the word little in the center of that. You have, might have other things in this corpus where it's a, the little dog, the little cat. It's always got little in it, but it's got other context. So this is capturing a little bit of the context of these um, situations. Now you notice that we're using letter trigraphs or, or letter three grams here as our cues. Uh, that's just a choice. You don't have to use those. We like to use this because this gets us a lot of the orthography, a lot of the form information, a lot of this kind of uh, information. We're interested in modeling. We're interested in modeling low-level uh, word recognition and stuff like that eye tracking data, all this kind of stuff. And we're finding that this kind of setup is one of the best we have for getting at that kind of model. You can also do something like this, and this is sort of interesting to those people who have used uh, word distrib uh, distribution semantic stuff like Beagle, HAL, LSA. What if your cues were words and the outcomes were words? So in this case, little and fox are cueing the outcome of biting, let's say. And I'll show you, hopefully, at the end, a little bit if we have time, about what kind of models this creates. But this creates something more like uh, your HAL, Beagle, LSA type model. I can't go into this too much, but uh, basically, this is sort of some traces of uh, strengths of between cues and outcomes uh, over training. This is the whole TASA corpus, <coughs> the first million events of the TASA corpus. 
And uh, as you can see, this Q for initial TH is the very strong one because it's queuing the very strongly. But uh, for example, the initial TH for thank is very weak. So you can see that there's a lot of queue competition. The is winning over the other ones. And so the initial TH is not a great queue for thank in this kind of model. Here's another one showing uh, a common issue maybe for people who are learning English. You have three words, you, your, and our. They share a lot of letters. They also share a lot of cues. And it shows you how this thing, as it learns, starts saying, well, this is a very negative weight. So if you are trying to figure out um, if it's your, the initial, the final OU is a very big sign that that's not your you're looking at. You, you're, this is not the right word. This is the wrong word. And uh, also, you get these sort of nice dips, which look like decays, but there's no decay parameters in this model. This is a pure learning model, so decay, if you see it, is completely epiphenomenal, which I find interesting. So, some examples with data in my last four minutes. Um, we made uh, some mixed corpora. We like mixing corpora now, so we get all sorts of corpora and take documents at random, so we don't have any corpus dependencies, we hope. And we can sum up the activations of active cues. And interestingly, as you increase the corpus size, this is trying to predict LDRT for 40,000 words out of the ELP. Bigger corpus, you get better correlations with uh, reac uh, excision reaction time with these sums of active weights. But that's not surprising. I mean, the big data usually gets bigger, it gets better. It's also this is sort of a crazy problem to try to predict reaction time 40,000 words. So I don't take too much stock in this yet, but we'll see what happens with this. And here's another one. You have um, some data from below to 1999. Uh, you have response latency of lexical reaction time for the same set of words. And we're doing the old minus the young. So this is the difference between people who are in their average age of 68 and let's say 25. And you see that uh, there's this nice curve here. Low frequency words, there's more, more slope and then it gets flat for the high frequency words. We do simulated reaction time where we take a 500,000 word corpus versus a 3 million word corpus. Our simulation gives the same kind of results. So we're showing that without any other parameters, just Changing the training data size, we see aging effects. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, old people are slow, right? Well, yeah, if you look at the data from the same Bologna study, uh, they're significantly slower. It's a small effect. I mean, this small effect is actually a big effect because of log scale. Um, our simulation, again, train on 500 million words. It takes longer to, uh, the simulated reaction times are all slower. I mean, not all slower, but they're significantly slower in this kind of uh, analysis. And then also another thing we've been doing is throwing in proper nouns. Because proper nouns, if you throw them into vocabulary, they'll blow the vocabulary up from, let's say, 100,000 words to 240,000 words. And older people may know more names. So again, you see that uh, when you include proper nouns, you get this 1 or 2% increase in R squared, just, just by training the model in a corpus that includes proper nouns. Um, finally, very little time to do this, unfortunately, but um, this is work by Peter Hendricks, not my work. But uh, there is a prime picture in an experiment. You prime with on the, and you can see strawberry. You can also prime with in the, and you see onion. In the onion, not very prototypical for onions. You don't usually put things in the onions. And then he did some ERP studies, used these cues, and uh, you have this nice length effect in the real data. And in the simulated data, you can see sort of that the patches of blue and yellow are in the same spot. So our NDL activation is capturing length effects without even trying. It's also capturing word frequency effects, relative entropy effects. This is how prototypical the use of the preposition is with those nouns. And uh, when you create a sort of new um, measure which uses the phrase, the whole phrase, the whole phrase and the summed activation of all the words in the phrase inverted, you get also phrase. This is n-gram frequency effect. So the frequency of the n-gram into the onion causes these kinds of ERP patterns and you can see very similar patterns in the simulation. So we're very much encouraged by this kind of parallel result. Um, and I, I'm going to say second one for seconds. I'm going to thank people there. If you want to see the what happens when you do this health stuff, I have slides, but I ran out of time. So I'll have to show you later. Thank you very much. Um, just go a little bit more slowly through how the connection was made between the model and the ERP results. Sure. Um, yeah, I was racing. I apologize. Uh, we take the cues to be the cues found in the whole phrase into the onion, and we're just 
taking the sum weight between each of those cues and the outcome onion and adding them up. So, and uh, that is what we're calling our simulated RT. And that's what's plotted here. And uh, this is four epochs of time from onset of stimulus to 900 milliseconds after stimulus. Um, these are the ERP uh, relationships in a GAM model tensor. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's not my, my personal work, but I'm happy to explain it. I do I know what's going on here. So I'm over time, so I'm going to have to cut myself off. And thank you all. Uh, we're going to go on to our next speaker.